Hello, Brave Nation, and welcome to episode 40. Yes, episode 40 of Brave Hawk Talk. I'm John Gross, and as always, Brave Hawk Talk is presented by Pepsi. Pepsi, that's what I like. Well, football season is finally here, and now you can get into the action. Join the Braves Club today so you can purchase your season pass. Our first game is March 20th. It's Heroes Day presented by Scotland Health. You will not want to miss this incredible, unique spring season of UNCP football. Contact Bull Slavin by emailing jack.slavin, S-L-A-V-I-N, at uncp.edu for more information. Today, we are joined by Brianna Decouteau of the UNCP soccer team and assistant athletic trainer Michael Musselwhite. Brianna, an all-conference defender, anchors a stout back line for one of the region's top programs. But her journey began nowhere near Pembroke, North Carolina. Here's our Scotland Health Student Athlete of the Week, Brianna Decouteau. Brianna, thank you so much for joining me today. At the time of this recording, we are uh, the night before a game day, so I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to hop on the podcast. Yeah, of course, no problem. Uh, what has this season been like for you so far? I know it's uh, a different one. It's a unique season, obviously playing in the spring. But uh, for you personally, what has this season been like? Um, honestly, this season has just been full of excitement. I know a lot of us girls haven't played in a while, and it's just been really great to get back finally on the field and play some opponents that we haven't seen in a, in a minute. And I'm just having a lot of fun, and I'm glad we got to – have our season even though it's not in the fall this year but it's still nice to get some games in were you concerned for at, at any point really that you would not have a season this year i was a little bit pes- pessimistic about us not getting our games in um i think i was kind of wondering how it would all work out and stuff but they managed to do it and we're one of the team, the only team, if not one of the only teams that have so far gotten all our games in, and I'm just really proud of us, and yeah. In speaking with some other student athletes really across our, our uh, athletic department at UNCP, there's been a common sentiment that when sports were taken away from them, and this you know, a lot of times comes from the winter or spring athletes, but even in your case, you weren't able to play in the fall. With sports taken away, they gained a greater appreciation for the sport that they play. Would you say that was the case for you as well? Definitely. Um, when we weren't playing, I definitely was missing it a lot, and I realized what a big part of my life playing soccer is. And so when it was taken away I was kind of like okay what do I do now because I would always be thinking about soccer thinking about our next opponent and I didn't I didn't have the chance to do that because we weren't going to be playing any games so I definitely grew an appreciation for the sport and every time I step on the field now I'm like you might not have this chance um, next game so just give it your all and do your best I love that mindset, especially in, in the time that we're in right now. Nothing is guaranteed, so I, I love to hear that. And, you know, entering this season, there were some high expectations for both uh, the team as a whole and for you personally. A, you were a preseason all-conference selection. Uh, did, did, did that add any extra pressure to, to put on yourself, or do you kind of just block all that outside stuff out? I think um, it kind of gave me the confidence to actually believe that I can do, like, that I'm actually decent at the sport and that I can, like, other people are recognizing that. And it's making me want to work harder and to be able to eventually at the end of the season maybe be PBC player, um, defender of the the season, or – make me reach that goal every season and not just have this be a one-time thing. Yeah, you mentioned what you're hoping for by the end of this season. What are some of the team goals that you have? I know we've played some matches and you and your squad have played some great soccer this year, but what are some of the team goals uh, as, as we move along this season? Um, one of our goals definitely is, since it's our last 
season in the PVC. We're moving to Conference Carolinas next season. Um, we want to make a statement that UNC Pembroke is a team that you should watch out for. And we want to obviously win, make it to the conference finals and win a ring. I haven't won a ring. We have two girls on the team that were here in the 2017 team. Um, they got a ring, and I know a lot of us want a ring. And even just finishing first place top of the standings would be awesome, too. Good. Well, we look forward to that, and uh, I certainly wouldn't put it past you and your teammates to put together a, a special season this year. Again, a great start so far, and uh, and we're excited for things to keep rolling along. And I want to dive into your past a little bit. One of the really cool things about uh, the UNCP Athletic Department is the a diverse group of student athletes that we have. We have student athletes from all over the world, and you are uh, from Canada, from uh, Montreal. Have you always lived in Montreal? Yes, I grew up in Montreal. I was born in Montreal. Um, I haven't lived anywhere else. What What was What was life like for you growing up in in Montreal? Um, I played soccer my entire life. Um, it came to the point where I had to decide between doing dance and soccer, and obviously I chose soccer. Um, so I've known soccer my whole life. My family is very athletic. Um, we were all involved in sports, and um, it's definitely different than here, I would say. One of my um, goals, which at the time I didn't think that I would be able to achieve it, but it was to play at a school in the U.S., I just thought that would be such an amazing experience, and I'm so grateful that I was able to get that experience. Um, but, yeah, some very cold winters, um, <laughs> nothing like here, and, yeah. yeah. You mentioned that you kind of had that goal to play soccer at a university in the U.S. Is that something that you're a sentiment that your peer shared as well, or is that fairly unique to your situation? Um, I think a lot of people want to. Um, it's not really common for people in Montreal or even in Canada to really go um, to a university that's even a couple hours away. Most people just stay local, and so for somebody to go outside of the country, that's a really big goal, and a lot of people are like, wow, like that's amazing. And yeah. And growing up in Montreal, I, I would imagine that you are bilingual? Yes. I okay. do speak French, fluent in French. Did Was there a first language or you grew up speaking both? Um, I grew up speaking both. So um, in, within my family, I speak in English. But at school, when I was in daycare, um, we would speak in French at school. You have to learn French. Um, if you want a job, basically, you need to know <laughs> how, to, how to speak French. So, yeah, it's involved in when I go back home and I work during the summer, um, I'm speaking mostly in French. So you don't really have a choice, which I do appreciate because not everybody has the opportunity to know more than one language. So coming here definitely um I gained an appreciation for being able to speak more than one language. Uh, J'ai étudié le français à l'école pour sept ans, mais uh, maintenant je ne me rappelle uh, rien. Wow, that was actually pretty good. I wasn't expecting that. So if you can see my face right now, you're <laughs> like, why not? <laughs> Merci beaucoup. <laughs> oh. I, uh, I, I wish I, I used to be fairly, I don't want to say I was ever fluent, but uh, I could hold a conversation, and I traveled to France and to, to Quebec a few times and was uh, had, had a good experience, but I, uh, I, I wanted to make sure that my French was still, uh, like, comprehensible. Yeah, I definitely understood. That was really good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, you mentioned that uh, you had the goal to play soccer uh, in the United States, and I know that you, I believe you started your career at a college, at, a, at another college, but uh, how'd you end up at UNCP? Um, so I, while I was my senior year of high school, I got a message from this guy that I had never heard of, and he was like, oh, you should come to my combine, and like, I, um, 
there's going to be a lot of U, uh, U.S. universities that uh, coaches, sorry, that are going to be there and they're going to watch you play. And I know there's um, one school that's really interested in you. So I think it would be a great opportunity. And at first, I was like, okay, this is kind of weird. Like, I've never heard of you. Why are you, like, messaging me? <laughs> and then I was speaking. I was actually about to not go. I was. I had told him, like, oh, I'm just going to wait until next year. I don't think I'm ready right now. And he kept pushing for me to go. So I was like, okay, you know what? Just let's do it. And so it's a weekend thing. So you play the Saturday and the Sunday. And there's a bunch of coaches that are just watching you. And at the end of the weekend, you speak to some coaches if they are interested in you. And so Coach Lars was the first one, and he came up to me, and he was like, I really want you. Like, I really loved what I saw out there this weekend, and I think you'd be a great fit. And so that was it. Did And, and at that point, you, you committed on the spot, or did you take some time um, to think so about it? Kinda, it took me a little minute to get, like, am I actually going to do this? So um, I was trying to, like, figure out if, even, like, I knew that I wanted to do it, but the thought of leaving my family and going somewhere that I didn't really know, I didn't know anybody, obviously. Um, so I was kind of hesitant on that part. Um, but in the end, I knew that I wanted to play soccer in the U.S., and so I just jumped for it. What has, or it could be multiple things, but what have some of the biggest adjustments been, especially early on when you first got to UNCP from uh, from living in Montreal to, to moving to Pembroke? Um, honestly, I don't think there's been that many adjustments. The main one being um, I kind of had to just get used to the girls really quickly so that I can have people that I can rely on and stuff. But that wasn't hard at all. Um, I was able to speak. Um, a lot of Montrealers don't are, like, okay in English, but I speak English at home, so that wasn't hard for me. Um, so I was able to communicate, thankfully, with everybody. But sometimes, like, I'll say certain words and they'll – make fun of me the way I say it but um yeah it it had it wasn't as hard to adjust as I thought it was going to be I have to ask what are some of those words um <laughs> so for some reason the way I say advanced like it sounds weird to them I don't know here um people don't really pronounce like I enunciate my words like I'll say every li- I'll <laughs> I don't know how to explain it. I'll say every letter in the word, like I'll pronounce it, but some people just like, like example, it was raining, like I'll say raining, but here the G is like non-existent. You get what I'm saying? Absolutely. I definitely do because I'm actually, I'm from the Northeast, so I say raining, but here you're right. The G is, the G is forgotten about and, uh, and I think we're on the same page. Every letter Every letter deserves to be pronounced. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So uh, where, when you look at your, your career soccer-wise at UNCP, where do you feel like you have grown the most from day one on campus to, to where you are now? Um, I've definitely grown more confident on the ball. I think before I was kind of um, – I wasn't sure about my ability to be able to handle the ball and, like, um do something positive with it other than just like kicking it so i've kind of i've grown to okay like just take a split second to look at your surroundings and find something productive to do instead of just kicking it and hope somebody will get there so i've definitely grown um confident in my ability to play with the ball um and just as a defender being like knowing that you can stand somebody up like even if they beat you you can I can run back and catch them before they do something or like just keep them in front of you and not let them get to the goal 
Lars has obviously built this program into uh, a regional power and uh, routinely in the, in the national rankings too. And, and Coach Badia played here and now coaches here. Yeah. What's it like to play under those two? Um, it's great, honestly. They definitely have a, a lot of knowledge um, about the sport and they make sure that we understand what they're explaining to us. They take a lot of time um, to produ- to give scouting reports on other teams. They dig and find anything they can find on the other teams, which helps us um, know our opponents before we even get to game day. And so that definitely helps us. And just their little, like, pointers of what we can do better and um, what we're already doing well and how we can improve and become better players. All right, let's transition off the pitch now. Do you have, I know you still have a couple of years left here at UNCP, but yeah. uh, do you have any plans or hopes for what you do post-graduation? Uh, my plan is to go back home in, to Montreal and um, get into law school. That's my plan. I don't think there's a very slim chance that I'll um, move here, but my plan is to go back home. Why do you want to pursue a career in law? Um, I've always, I love like reading and digging and finding information. And so that's always been like something that I'm interested in. And um, I love reading about cases and stuff like that. So I've, always, I've just had an interest in law. All right. Well, we'll end with a, a fun question here. I, I okay. see based on your, uh, your bio that you are quite the traveler. Number yeah. one, two-part question. Number one, where's the favorite place you've been? Number two, where is what, what's the top of the bucket list for you? A place that you have not been, but one day you hope to go. Um, my favorite place that I've been is definitely Italy. I went um, to different cities in Italy, and the views are gorgeous. Like I don't think you can beat it. There, it was just so awesome. Um, and a place that I would love to go would be, I've always had Australia in my mind for some reason. But at the same time, I'm a little scared because they got crazy um, bugs and snakes <laughs> and stuff like that. So, <laughs> uh, But yeah, I'd love to go to Australia. Cool. Well, hopefully one day that could happen. And yeah, avoid those yeah. spiders. And uh, even the kangaroos yeah. can be dangerous. Those things will punch you. Yeah. So, so stay away from that. But uh, Brianna, thank you so much for hopping on the podcast today. We're so excited for the rest of your season and, uh, and best of luck the rest of the way. Thank you. I really had a fun time with you. Thanks again to Brianna for hopping on. We look forward to the rest of her spring season. Brave Nation, now is your chance to get behind our baseball and softball programs by supporting UNCP Stadium renovation plans. These plans include a revamped baseball and softball stadium and will provide both programs with the facilities that they need to compete at the highest of levels. So show your support today by visiting uncpbraves.com forward slash give. March is National Athletic Training Month, the time for us to thank and honor those who keep our team safe and healthy, especially in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. One of those ATs at UNCP is Michael Musselwhite, a proud UNCP alum and a man of many interests. Let's welcome Michael Musselwhite to Bravehawk Talk. First of all, thank you so much for joining me today. I know that you are in the middle of, uh, of working with two teams during this spring season, so I appreciate you taking time out of your day to hop on the podcast. Yeah, man. Appreciate you having me. Uh, we know this has been a very different year, and uh, and all the athletic trainers have really had their roles adjusted uh, to kind of fit the current COVID climate uh, in college athletics. How has your role changed uh, over this past year? Uh, honestly, not not too much. Uh, I know we had a little bite with it in the fall uh, as far as COVID and going through all the learning curves. But, you know, since January, man, we've, we've been testing pretty much the whole team once a week and uh, the guys are doing real good as far as, you know, staying masked up and distance and um, 
really for me, man, it's just kind of been just kind of staying on a few of them in the training room, putting their mask on and having to do, you know, testing 40 guys a week. Um, other than that, though, we're just rolling through it like normal. So uh, for me, I've been kind of lucky and fortunate that, you know, it's just kind of one little day a week that I've got something extra to do. Um, but we're, we're rolling with it. And you work with both both baseball and golf. Is there a difference in how you kind of go about your job between those two teams? No. Uh, so with baseball, you know, baseball is just a lot of it's a lot of time. Uh, you know, it's morning treatments and then practice and then after practice we got weights and um, you know. So there, I'm a little bit more involved with baseball than I am with golf. Golf. You know, shout out to my golf team. They kind of take care of themselves. Uh, But they know normally I see them, you know, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, whenever they get back from tournaments. Um, And, you know, they're both – I've been kind of fortunate enough to have two maintenance sports. Um, So there's not a lot of, uh, I guess, acute stuff that happens. There's some here and there. But uh, mainly for me it's just maintenance and just checking in on people, you know, if something pops up, I try to take care of it uh, as soon as I can just because, with, especially with baseball, you know, we're playing Saturday, Sunday, or Friday, Saturday, and then all of a sudden we're back in the game on Tuesday, Wednesday. And, um, you know, with golf, you know, they're, they're kind of on a on a schedule where they play once a week, but when they go play, you know, they're, they're playing 36 holes in, in two days and um, – you know, so it's a lot of recovery. It's a lot of, you know, just checking in with people, seeing how they're feeling. And the biggest thing is just trying to keep everybody fresh. So uh, not too much difference, but, um, you know, they're obviously two different sports. So Right. Now, uh, before we move on, I do want to wish you a very happy National Athletic Training Month. And thank you for all that you do here at UNCP. Um, I know there, there have been some – some cool things going on nationwide to kind of honor what uh, what you and your fellow ATs do. I'm curious, from your perspective, why do you feel that it's important to recognize the work that athletic trainers do? Um, because I, I guess the most part, you know, we're we're behind the scenes a lot of times, and um, we we kind of have a thankless job. Uh, you know, me and Joe, we always say that uh, we don't expect anything from anybody you know this is our job to kind of take care of the athletes and take care of the odd and end administration stuff but um you know I, I, it's kind of a good month to you know everybody's getting outside and you know they might notice and have, uh, somebody sitting in the dugout or somebody on the sideline and it's just kind of like a thank you to all, all athletic trainers for all the hard work that they put in and um yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, well, let's go back a little bit. Uh, why did you decide to get into athletic training? Uh, well, I, I kind of have a similar story. Just about any athletic trainer you ask, they'll probably give you the same uh, <laughs> spiel. But, uh, you know, high school athlete, got hurt. I uh, spent a lot of time with my athletic trainer at my high school, uh, he was actually the former head athletic trainer here at UNCP, um, Matt Lundeen. Um, but, you know, I, did, I, I separated my AC joint in a wrestling match my senior year, and I spent a lot of time, you know, doing rehab and stuff like that with him, and it, it just became interesting to me. And I've always been uh, interested in sports. Uh, the college athletics thing wasn't really for me. Uh, but I was in, I was interested in sports, also interested in medicine, and you know as soon as I found out you know what athletic training consisted of, I was like, man, this is like my calling. So you know a lot of people when they enter college they don't know what they want to do, what you know what career they want to chase. But you know I came in freshman year like, hey, athletic training, I'm hitting this thing full bore, um, and and rolling with it. So. Um, I was very fortunate on that aspect that I found, you know, my, I guess, desire early uh, rather than later. So, and, and and I'm sure that really gave you a head start and some opportunities from from really from day one as an undergrad. And, and you came to UNCP, and when you got to campus, as an as an undergrad, how were you able to? 
kind of get involved as an athletic trainer and really get that hands-on experience? Yeah, so uh, the athletic training undergrad program, uh, it's, now a, it's now a master's program, but uh, from the get-go, you know, you have starting your sophomore year, you've got observation hours you've got to do. Uh, you you got to become familiar with, you know, the staff here on campus and uh, take the classes to get into the athletic training program. Uh, and then once you're in the athletic training program, you know, you've got a set number of hours that you've got to complete each semester. You get assigned with a preceptor. You get, uh, you know, you're with uh, a sport or two at the time. So you, you get a lot of experience early on as far as, like, you know, the job demands and um, things to expect as an athletic trainer. And, um, you know, it's good and bad because, you know, some people kind of get here and they're like, well, man, I don't want to have to, you know, I got here at 8 o'clock this morning and I'm here till 9 covering a a game. You know, they don't like it. But, um, you know, for me, it just, you know, I've always felt a part of any team that I've worked with. So I just kind of look at it as, like, hey, I'm here with the team and, um, you know, I learned that early on. So that was very fortunate for me uh, because a lot of people don't find that out until down the road. But um, a lot of experience. Uh, you know, I, I worked football my senior year with Mike. Um, I feel like that was my year that I kind of really grew and, and uh, developed a lot more skills over there. Yeah, you mentioned you come to college with this mindset of of what you want to do was there a moment as an undergrad that you were doing something athletic training related and you realized wow this is legit i am actually doing what i really want to do right now i wouldn't necessarily say um, uh, one particular moment um i would say it's more along the lines of you know each day was you know was great it was different it kept me involved um, and, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, as, as an undergrad student, you make it through the fall or you you make it through the spring, and after the semester you kind of reflect on it a little bit. Um, it's easy to get caught up in the day-by-day stuff. Like, you know, if you had a bad day, then, you know, it's easy to dwell on that. But, you know, if you look at it from, like, a semester standpoint, I was, you know, like I said, lucky enough to have really good rotations, really good preceptors, Um and that's kind of like a mentor thing, but, um, you know, so you look back on the semester and look at how much you grew, look at how how you've impacted some of the athletes that you've worked with and things like that, and I think that that's just what kind of makes it for me. So you graduated from UNCP in 2014, and I know you're still here now. Was there – did you immediately start working at UNCP, or was there some looking around? Yeah, so uh, I graduated, uh, got certified, graduated, and then, um, my, like I said, my senior year I worked football over uh, at Caton with uh, Mike, um, and then he had asked me to come on as a graduate assistant. Um, so I did two years with the football team as a graduate assistant. Um, uh, once that got over with, I uh, got my master's. I went to Pernell Sweat High School with uh, Southeastern uh, I actually believe they just changed their name to UNC Health. Um, but I was an outreach athletic trainer at Pernell Sweat High School, um, and I really enjoyed that for a year. It was a good learning experience. Um, and then shortly into the fall of my second year, um, this position came open, uh, working with baseball and golf. And baseball has always been my number one passion uh, so as soon as I found out that this was a full-time position working with two sports that I, I really enjoy, um, I knew I had to kind of make a change here. So um, I was fortunate enough to get the job here, and I've been here since um, I think it was 2017. So this is like my fourth year. You mentioned that baseball's really your passion. Uh, what has what's what's it like to work with this baseball program? I know a, a very successful program, like you talked about earlier. It's it's a pretty big team too. Uh, so what's it like to be their athletic trainer? Oh man, I'm telling you, from day one, I have just been like a sponge out there with those guys. Uh, between you know, between Paul and Jeff uh, and, and Box, Big Red, and uh, and Collins, you know. Those guys, I thought I knew a lot about the sport coming in, but I was, you know, quickly 
uh, check. You know, those guys really know how to coach a team, prepare a team. Um, and I've been really lucky to have those guys in my corner as far as being the trainer. Um, you know, they kind of give me the leeway to kind of do – do what I think is necessary with guys, and they, they value my input on some certain things. And, um, you know, I, I couldn't ask for a better staff to work with. Um, and, and on top of that, you know, we're a competitive program. Uh, you know, every Friday night or, you know, this year, every Friday or Saturday, game one, man, it's, you know, it's heated, it's good baseball, you know, and I got a good seat, <laughs> you know. Um and just to be around the guys in the dugout and that kind of thing, it's 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 cool to do. Um, I, I couldn't really imagine myself doing anything else after working with this team uh, the past three or four years. Um, if I if somebody told me I had to leave, I would probably look for a similar baseball team to go work for. So, um, but yeah, it's been great, man. I, I enjoy every day, every game. Uh, I'm just glad that we got to play this season because. Uh, you know, after last year's debacle with COVID, um, you know, there for April and May, I was just sitting around like missing baseball, just like everybody else. So um, it's good to be back for sure. I know it really depends. Uh, certain athletic trainers will, will maybe just, if, if they're sitting with the team during a game, they'll just sit there and, and kind of be by themselves and watch and help as needed. Others are very into it and cheering and yelling. Which which uh, side of the spectrum do you fall on? Oh man, I'm right. I'm right in there with them. Um, you know, I'm I'm. I've asked Jeff. I don't know how many times what the signs are. <laughs> you know, things like that. <laughs> just so you know, I keep up with counts and um, you know, if you know, I try to watch the other teams, hitters, pitchers. You know, uh, and that's another thing with my job, man. You know, I'm not. You know, I'm not responsible for coaching or anything like that. So a lot of what I end up doing is just watching, you know, if a guy gets a hit and he's, you know, he's got a hard 90 down the line and, you know, all of a sudden he's breaking down, he's limping back to first, he may not say something or I may not go check on him, but I kind of keep like a little mental note. Um, That way if something pops up, you know, for the next day or between the innings, I can kind of address it. But, you know, I'm, I'm locked in just like everybody else, man, just kind of, you know, keeping with the pitches and that kind of thing. So, um, it, it's a, it makes for a long day if you're just sitting there just kind of waiting for it to be over. That's for sure. Outside of your job as an athletic trainer, from what I've heard, you have quite a, quite a few hobbies. And every week or so, apparently, <coughs> you pick up a new hobby. So uh, what is, what's, what's your current hobby and, and what are some of the recent things you've been working on? Oh, man. I, I, I lose track of them, John, honestly. Um you know, there for a little while, I, I thought I was going to get into some kind of taxidermy, uh, and, uh, you know, with ducks and deer and that kind of thing. Uh, I'm a big outdoorsman. Um, that kind of fell through once I realized how kind of uh, nasty that some of that stuff was. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, between, like, home brewing and uh, some other odd men, you know, craftsman-type stuff, uh it's kind of my wife tells me I kind of pick up something and drop it as soon as it gets interesting. So uh, I'm always looking for something new and something different to kind of mess with. Um, ever since COVID, though, I've started a a, a a power washing company, so I've been learning a lot about that, uh, doing some of that on the side. But where, where do you find these hobbies? Do, do, do they just pop up out of nowhere? You come across it online? You think of something? Man, I. I have no clue. Uh, I'll see something and I'll think it's cool or I'll see like a, a product or I'll see, uh, you know, I know at one point I, I was trying to make uh, game calls uh, just out of stuff you find around the house. Uh, you know, I might see a video or somebody's making something or somebody's doing something and I'm like, well, man, like I can do that. And uh, sure enough, I've got to try it. You know, there's no... Uh, I have a hard time saying no to some things. So if, if I get down like a rabbit hole on YouTube or uh, Twitter or something, I'm you know more than likely going to end up leaving there with a hobby or or looking to uh, purchase something anyway. You know. All right. But, so so let's end with this on that same topic. Is there a major project or some sort of hobby that 
you really want to work on one day, but you just have not had the time to do it? The number one thing that you want to do. Ooh. Ah, man. Uh, you know, if, if I got to be honest with you, ever since I was in, I mean, I'd say ever since I was in high school, I've been really interested in duck calls. Um, and there's, it's really a, um, it's really like a lot of people just think it's like a little funny horn type thing, but th there's a lot of detail that goes into making those things sound realistic. Um, and I would really love to get myself a wood lathe and turn some duck calls, but man, I'm talking, there's guys that have to practice that stuff for years before they get a sound that they like. Um, so, I mean, that would be cool. Uh, that would be like, you know, Maybe like if I'm retired, you know, start messing with that kind of stuff. But um, other than that, not really. Um, a lot of my stuff now is focused with outdoors and hunting and that kind of thing. So um, I would say that would be my number one, like, next project I would look at getting into. And those duck calls would require you to utilize some sort of wooden whistle or or something else? Or can, yeah, so it's, okay. it's just... You got to make a two-piece wood. Uh, I mean, you can make it wood or acrylic, but it's a two-piece kind of. You can think of it like a flute almost. Uh, you know, so you've got to have like you got to have some special machinery to make them how you want it. But um, you know, I think that's the biggest thing that is it stop. That's the reason why I haven't got into it yet. I'll tell you that is the the lathe is a little expensive, and some of the tools you got to have is a little expensive, but. Um, it, it, that would, I could see myself in the future trying to do something with that, just, you know, on the side there. See, if it did not require a, a, a flute-like uh, wooden pipe, I, I would have asked you to do it right now on the podcast. But since it requires some sort <laughs> of uh, ex, extra um, equipment, we'll, we'll let you pass for now. Right. Well, they're, they're out there in the truck. I can go grab them. <laughs> Listen, I, I, I'll have to see a demonstration one day. But, uh, but thank you so much for your time today. Again, uh, with uh, National Athletic Training Month, just thank you so much for all that you and your fellow ATs do. Uh, for those listening who maybe don't see all the behind the scenes uh, here at UNCP Athletics, everything that goes on could not happen without the work of our athletic trainers. So uh, thanks for all you do, and thanks for helping out today. Thank you, John. Have a good one. Thanks so much for tuning in. A reminder to follow us on all of our social media platforms at UNCP underscore sports and subscribe on YouTube. We'll be back next week. Have a great rest of your week and remember to mask up.